You're listening to the First Baptist Starkville podcast. Be sure to subscribe so you can listen to our sermons as soon as they're available every week. We hope this message will be a blessing to you. Good morning, church. It is good to see you all here. A few weeks ago, Pastor Andy called and said, hey, I'm out of town. You're up. No question. Just, you're up. Yes, sir, I'm up. So here I am. My hope for you today is that as we explore God's Word, one, you will be encouraged. Two, you will find something that you can walk home with and start living out. Because if all we're doing is hearing God's Word, that's a good thing. But applying it to our lives is what I'm hopeful for. So here we are. Let's get to it, shall we? So have you ever had that moment in life where you're out and about and you run into somebody that you know and either they don't recognize you or you don't recognize them? It can be a little awkward, can it? I had this happen to me several years ago. I was in Cookville, Tennessee. I was doing student ministry there. My wife and I were out one night and I had heard rumor that one of my high school friends, Brian, had moved to Cookville. I hadn't seen him. I hadn't seen anything on social media that he was in town. Just a rumor. And so my wife and I were out. We're at the bookstore. I don't know why we're at the bookstore. She doesn't read much. I have way too many books. I, we should not have been there. But we needed something to do to kill time before we had to get to our next thing. And I'm, so I'm, I'm looking around, and I look up, and three or four aisles ahead of me in the bookstore is Brian. Brian hadn't changed a bit since high school, still had the same haircut, was about the same height, was about the same weight. It was clearly Brian. And in my mind, I start wrestling with, do I go say something? Do I reintroduce myself? Do I just ignore him and hope that I can get out of the store without having to talk to him? And I wrestled with this for probably way too long in my head. And eventually I landed on, okay, I'm going to be a man. I'm going to, I'm going to pull up my big boy pants and I'm going to go say hi. So Brian's got his back to me. I walk down his aisle and I get a few feet away and I stop and I'm like, hey, Brian, how are you? And Brian, here's his name. He turns around. He looks at me. And he looks at me. And he looks at me. And he finally goes, do I know you? awkward because in that moment I had to be like oh yeah don't you remember me I'm Dave Cruz that guy from high school I know I'm a little heavier I have a little different hair now but don't you remember like man we ran around with the same group of of guys in high school we went to the same church we were in the same youth group we both played trombone we were nemesis in high school band because we both wanted to be the first chair we marched side side by side Do you not remember that I spent the night at your house and we actually went and rolled people's houses together? (laughs) He didn't recognize me. Hair bit awkward. So my question is, what happens when we encounter someone that we know but we don't recognize? And what happens when that person happens to be Jesus? Now, some of you in this room are going to go, well, I would recognize Jesus. I've been walking with him since I was a little kid. I would definitely recognize him. And you know what? You might. But I think if we were to go around and have time to get each one of you to come up on this stage, don't worry, we're not going to ask you to do that. I know some of you would not like that. But if we were to ask you, hey, describe Jesus to us, we would begin to hear a variety of descriptions, wouldn't we? Some of you are going to talk about Jesus and just how much, how much he embodies love and how great he is and how he's just a big, cuddly teddy bear and you want to hug him. Some of you are going to talk about, like, genie Jesus. Oh, man, I have all these things, and I simply say, Jesus, I need you to do this for me, and I rub the lamp, and he does it for me. Poof. Some of you are going to talk about a cosmic judge Jesus who's got all these rules and is looking to bust you. Some of y'all are going to talk about laid-back Jesus. Hey, man, sin, it's no big deal. Don't worry about it. It's all good. Some of you are going to talk about a Jesus that's more Republican. Some of you are going to talk about a Jesus that's more Democrat. Some of you are going to talk about a Jesus who's an anarchist. Your experiences in life are going to influence how you perceive Jesus, how you were raised, the things that have happened to you. They're all going to color how you talk about Jesus to people. And I think if we're honest and we heard everyone's answers, we would begin to realize my understanding of Jesus is limited. 
I understand facets of Jesus, but I don't get the whole person of Jesus. And I think if we begin to really explore Scripture and take time to understand who Jesus is in His entirety, we would begin to see a picture of Jesus that's a little bit and maybe a lot bit different than the Jesus that you would describe to somebody. And so today... We're going to take a brief moment. We're going to look at an encounter with Jesus where he looks a lot different than the author had ever encountered. So we're going to be in Revelation chapter 1. If you have your Bible, flip over there with me. If you don't have a Bible, it'll be on the screen. If you have a Bible and you don't know where Revelation is, go to the very back of the book. It's the very last book of the Bible. Chapter 1, starting in verse 9. And here's what John writes. I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet. All right, let's stop there. I never want to assume you understand what is happening. So let's take a moment and paint this picture and answer some questions. There's this guy named John. We'll talk a little more about him in just a second. He is on the island of Patmos. Now, most likely, John has been exiled by the Roman government to this island. That's what most scholars hold to. That's what we're going to hold to. So John is an exile on an island, and he has been sent there because he has basically caught the attention of the Roman government for the work that he is doing for the New Testament church, and they are a little threatened by him. And what do you do with the threat? You try to get rid of it. So they exiled John to this island on Patmos where he... We, I mean, I don't know about you, but when I think about being exiled, I immediately kind of go to like Castaway. It's one guy on an island by himself with nothing else. He's got to do all the work by himself, but that's not reality of being exiled. He's been exiled to a community on the island of Patmos where most likely he is working in a stone quarry, mining rock for the government's building projects. And there are other people on this island with him doing similar work. So there's a community around him. He has work that he's supposed to do, but he also has opportunities. So this exile isn't like, hey, you're out there on your own. He is with a community of people, and most likely some of them are believers as well. And he's been exiled for the work that he's doing. And we come to this point where he's like, hey, it's the Lord's day. And I was in the Spirit. Now the Baptists in us automatically go, what does that mean? I'm in the Spirit. We get a little uncomfortable when people use those words, right? We're afraid we're about to break out in tongues and someone's going to grab tambourine and banner and start running up and down the aisles, right? That's not what's happening here. That would be interesting to see happen here, wouldn't it? Wow. But that's not what's happening with John. He's simply worshiping. It's the time that the church has come together on the island of Patmos, the Sabbath, the Lord's Day. And most likely, John is so focused on God that he's just meditating and he's got that that tunnel vision of God. Now, who is John, you may be asking. I think that's really important for us to understand because it's going to influence the rest of this conversation. John is one of the chosen 12 apostles, one of the chosen 12 disciples of Jesus. He did ministry and life with Jesus for approximately three years. And even though John was part of the twelve, even more so, John was part of the inner three. There were a couple of the twelve that Jesus would occasionally say, hey, you you come here, you three, come with me. We're going to leave the rest of these guys behind and I'm going to show you a few extra things that you need to know. So John has walked with Jesus for about three years. He has seen things. Now, John has been taught by Jesus. He has heard Jesus teach in the temple. He has heard Jesus debate with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He has seen Jesus do miracles like turning water to wine, walking on water, feeding the multitudes of thousands. He has seen Jesus heal people and cast out demons. He was with Jesus on the mountain when Jesus was transfigured and the glory of God was revealed in Jesus. John knows who Jesus is. He was with Jesus in the garden when Jesus was arrested. He was there when Jesus was hung on the cross. Jesus looked at him while he was on the cross and said, John, you take care of my mama. And he was there when Jesus was put in the tomb and he encountered Jesus three days later when he was resurrected. If anybody is going to recognize Jesus, it is John. Let's pick it back up. 
And I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, Write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and to Smyrna and to Pergamum and to Thyatira and to Sardis and to Philadelphia and Laodicea. And then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. And on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands was one like the Son of Man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze refined in a furnace, and his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. Write, therefore, the things that you have seen, and those that are, and those that are to take place after this. Father, this is your word for your people. Help us to understand what it means for us today, and help us to live it. We pray this in your name. Amen. So there's John encountering Jesus, and I'm sure he's looking up going, this doesn't look anything like the Jesus that I've encountered before. Right? He had spent years with Jesus on earth, but Jesus never looked like this. And so let's take a minute, and let's look at the Jesus that John encountered there on the island of Patmos. And the first thing that we hear is John hears a voice behind him like a trumpet, Loud and, and powerful. That's what trumpets are. They get your attention. You know that they're there when they start playing. And so this voice is one that commands attention. And as John turns to see what is this powerful voice behind me, he says, I see one who is like the Son of Man. Now, if you're a New Testament person, you know that throughout the Gospels, Jesus is called the Son of Man. But if you're an Old Testament person, you begin to realize, oh wait, this is hearkening back to Daniel 7, where he talks about the Son of Man, who is the Lord of all. And so John, in writing about Jesus, is saying, hey, this is both the guy that we walk around with on earth, but it's also the guy that Daniel was talking about back in our day, well, well before our day. So here it is, this man with a loud voice, a powerful voice, who is like the Son of Man. And then he begins to talk about him. He was wearing a, a long robe and a golden sash. Now, we don't walk around wearing robes and sashes today, so maybe we don't quite understand what this means. But a long robe actually was a sign of one who was of nobility and a person of power and authority. And sashes were pretty common in those days, but where you wore it explained a lot. Oh yeah, that's my Merry Christmas card. Wouldn't you love to get that instead of little baby Jesus on your Christmas card? That'd be something different, wouldn't it? All right, so back to Jesus wearing this, this sash around his chest. The common person, who, the day laborer, would wear it around their waist. But if you were nobility, you wore it around your chest because it signified that you were somebody important. And obviously gold. Well, we all know that gold means you, that you have some kind of, well, something most people don't have. And so Jesus, in his appearance, just what he's wearing is automatically looking like someone who is authoritative and noble. And then it talks about his hair. It's, it's white, like wool, like snow. Well, Jesus is showing us, hey, I've been around a lot longer than just my time on earth. Right? And it talks in Scripture, it talks about uh, gray hair, white hair as being a sign of wisdom. Someone that we should listen to. And that his eyes were fiery. Oh, there's power and there's authority within, but it's also the power and the authority to look and judge other people. Are you being obedient or disobedient. And then it talks about his feet looking like bronze. Bronze being stable and strong, but then it talks about it was bronze out of the furnace, meaning it had been purified. So this, this person, like the Son of Man, has strong, pure strength. Hmm. And then, I'm blanking on what was next. Let me check again. Ah, here we go. And then from his mouth came a sharp, two-edged sword now that's a grotesque look if you think about it. But it, sh it shows, hey, my words have strength to cut to the truth. And there's authority in what I say. And then his face shone like the sun. Again, 
If you're familiar with Scripture, you go back to Exodus where Moses has encountered God on Mount Sinai and is given the, the law and commandments. He comes down and his face is shining because he is radiating the glory of God. But you go to the New Testament at Jesus' transfiguration where within him his true nature comes out and John was there and saw Jesus shining like the sun. This person before, before John is clearly Jesus shining in his glory again. Now, if you look at John's words, you may not catch this. The hairs of his head were white like white wool. His feet were like bronze, a burnished bronze. Uh, His face was like the sun. John keeps using this word like over and over and over. Why? Because John is struggling to describe Jesus. This image that John is painting is still incomplete because he lacks the vocabulary to actually describe the glorified, risen, majestic Jesus. He's trying. He's trying to communicate to these churches, hey, here's the Jesus I encountered, but I don't have the right words, the right vocabulary to actually tell you in its totality, what majestic Lord Jesus is really like. And I'll be honest with you, I'm okay with that. I am totally okay that John's incapable of totally explaining what Jesus looked like because that means Jesus is above my understanding. Jesus is above my vocabulary. There's depth and mystery to Jesus that we just cannot fully explain. Now, I hope that gives you some comfort Because hopefully there will be a time soon when you're trying to talk to someone about Jesus and you just lack the words. John, who had spent all this time with Jesus, was struggling to explain to the reader, this is the Jesus I encountered. We should be okay when we try to talk about Jesus with people and we can't find the right words because we're trying to talk about someone who is so much more than our human brains can truly comprehend. You don't have to understand every iota of Jesus. You simply have to talk about that which you know. And that's what John is doing. And so here's John. He's looking at Jesus. He clearly recognizes him. There's no uh, Dave Cruz at the bookstore moment. Do I know you? No. John recognizes, oh, I am in the presence of the resurrected, majestic Lord Jesus. And I love what happens. John's response is what? He falls on the ground. He falls on the ground in the presence of majestic Lord Jesus. And it reminds me of Isaiah chapter 6, where Isaiah is in the throne room and has encountered the glory of God, and he falls down and worships. And I'm reminded of Daniel chapter 10, where in his vision he is in the throne room and he encounters the majestic God. And he falls down and worships. And I'm reminded of Peter when he encounters the resurrected Jesus. He falls down when he realizes who he is before. And so John's response is one that we see throughout Scripture. When you encounter the majestic Lord Jesus, you are most likely going to fall on your face. Because you recognize that the person that you're before is so much more than you've ever been able to comprehend You see, we walk around with this understanding of Jesus based on our relationship and our experiences in life. But like I said earlier, it's not the full picture. And if you and I truly have encountered Jesus, our response to him should be much like John. We fall before him. And much like John, Jesus is going to reach down with his hand and say, get up, get up, I'm here for you. And as we look at John and the rest of Revelation, we see a few things that are true for all of us today. Now, don't worry, we are not going to read all of Revelation today. I do encourage you to go home and read all of Revelation, though. Uh, Try not to get hung up in the uh, symbolism too much. Just read it. But there's three things that I see happen through the rest of Revelation that, that John is a part of, that when we truly encounter Jesus and recognize Him for who He truly is, we, we are called into the same things that John is. So let's look at these. And we've already, we've already seen one of them. 
When Jesus pulled John up and the first time he spoke to him, he told him, I want you to write these things down. Write these down for the church. You're about to see some pretty interesting things, John. I want you to write these down. And so when we encounter Jesus, much like John, we are freed to do kingdom work. We have kingdom responsibility, right? Every person who has encountered Jesus and professed him as Lord and Savior and acknowledged him as that, you have a kingdom responsibility. John has already been doing this some. He's been helping lead the New Testament church. But even now on the island of Patmos, Jesus shows up and says, John, I've got more for you to do. Here is the next thing I want you to do for the kingdom. And I want you to think for a second, have I truly made Jesus my Lord and Savior? And if you can answer that yes, then you have kingdom responsibility that God has for you. The question is, will you do it? Will you do it? And if your answer is no, then I think maybe you might want to check, who did I really encounter? Because when you come face to face with God, and you recognize who Jesus is, you discover really quick, I don't have the ability to say no. I didn't share this with the first hour, but when I was wrestling with my call to ministry, uh, I, I was supposed to do rock and roll for my life. I love it. I love music. I love running sound. I, run, I love doing light stuff. Um, that's what I was going to do with my life. And God had been speaking to me over and over, hey, I want you to go into ministry. I've got a call on you for ministry. And I was like, no, 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 no. That is not what I'm doing. And I remember one night, uh, we were at a youth event with my church at the time. Um, God finally got a hold of me, and he said, you just have to decide now. Am I truly the Lord of your life or not? And if I am, you need to go be in ministry. And if I'm not, walk away. Man, when God impresses upon you, this is the thing I have for you, it's hard to say no. Because it comes down to are you really the Lord of my life? So if Jesus is your Lord, if you've truly given your life, God has kingdom responsibility for you. And he's calling you to be a part of it and to do it. Not, for, not because he needs you, but because he wants you. So when you encounter the resurrected Lord Jesus, you are freed for kingdom responsibility. The second thing I noticed comes out of Revelation 21, verse 17. I'm going to summarize it for you. But basically, John is capturing the words of Jesus and the Holy Spirit, and it, and it says, uh, the, the bridegroom and the Spirit desire for all people to drink of the water. All people to drink of the water and be satisfied. Now, this is the end of the book where Jesus has shown John all of these things are, that are happening, and he says to John, I want everybody to have opportunity to experience the life that I offer. And John captures this and shares it with the New Testament church. Why? Because we all are called to compassion for other people. If you've experienced uh, the risen Lord Jesus, then you have experienced the compassion that Jesus has for you. And he has the same passion for everybody. And we are the vessels by which that compassion is taken. It does not matter what these people look like. It does not matter where they're from. It does not matter what their socioeconomic standing is. It does not matter their politics. It does not matter how they smell. It simply matters that you look at them with the eyes that Jesus looks at them and have compassion on them and want to share with them that which Jesus has allowed you to experience. Freedom, salvation, redemption, wholeness, restoration to the relationship with the God who created you to be in relationship with Him. We can't do that with people if we don't have compassion for them. And if we don't have compassion for people, then we're basically saying, I'm okay with you going to hell. And that's a sobering thought right there. We are called by our majestic Lord resurrected Jesus to have compassion 
and to take the water that he offers, the life that he offers to all people. Now these first two things, responsibility and compassion, man, it sounds a lot like living sin, doesn't it? That which Pastor Andy's been talking to us about. I'm new and I'm picking up this language still and figuring out what does this even look like. But as I was preparing for this, I'm like, oh, live scent is all over this. So the last thing that I notice in John's uh, book in Revelation, when he encounters the resurrected Lord Jesus, he's freed for kingdom responsibility. He's called to carry out the compassion to all people. And the last thing is this. It's just easier to read it to you. Revelation chapter 5. Don't turn there. Just listen. Chapter 5, verse 8. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priest to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. And then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that it is in them saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen, and the elders fell down and worshipped. John is participating in heavenly worship. He is there. He is seeing the creatures and the elders. He is hearing all of creation cry out to God, Glory and honor are yours. And if we recognize Jesus, the same is true of us. We are invited into this worship both now, but also when we go to heaven. And I can't wait to be there and and join in on that. To cry out with all of creation to God, You are worthy. But in the meantime, we can do that right here, right now, in our personal lives, as a church. Cry out to God, you are worthy. Cry out to Jesus, you are the one who makes this even possible. And everything that Jesus spoke into existence one day will do that. The question is, can we do that now? Can you do it now? So when we encounter the resurrected Lord Jesus and we recognize who He is, kingdom responsibility, compassion, and then freedom to worship. Those are some pretty big things for all people who follow Jesus. So we're going to come to to the part where we wrap it up and and we head home, but I, I think that I need to ask two questions for you to chew on. And I think they're very important questions, so I'm not asking you to answer them right now. Maybe you need to, but Maybe you need to really think on these. And so my first question, do you recognize Jesus? Do you really know who he is? Now, some of you in this room are going, yes, I wholeheartedly know who Jesus is, and that's awesome. Hang on, the second question is for you. But if you're in this room and you're going, I don't know that I recognize Jesus. I don't know that I've ever encountered him in such a way that I realize what I've been freed from and brought into. Well, we'd love to have a conversation with you. In a few minutes, I'm going to stand here with some other staff members. Maybe you just need to come down and say, hey, I I got a question. I need to to start a conversation. And and let me just be honest. I recognize that walking down front may be a little overwhelming. Um, That's okay. If you can't bring yourself to walk down, hey, we're going to be hanging out at the Cove, which is right behind me. I'd love to meet you and start that conversation. This is the most important question you will ever be faced with. Do you recognize who Jesus is? Have you encountered him? No other question matters. So start there. 
Do you recognize? Have you encountered Jesus? Now, those of you in this room who said, yes, I have, here's my question for you. How are you growing in your understanding and your recognition of Jesus? Are you part of a community that allows this to happen? Now, don't hear me say you can't do this on your own. You definitely should be studying Scripture on your own. But like I talked about, if you're only doing what you understand, you're only getting a small picture of Jesus. There is value to being part of a community that walks with you and shares their experiences with Jesus to help you develop a fuller picture of who Jesus really is. I can talk to you about things that you've never experienced that's going to open your eyes to a little bit more of the reality of Jesus, but you've gone through things in your life that I've never gone through that will help me understand more about Jesus. We are created to be in community first with God, but then with each other for the purpose of helping us be drawn closer to Jesus. And so are you a part of community? And if the answer is no, why not? Now, I've been in ministry long enough. I've heard all of the excuses for why, we shouldn't, why you can't be in a group. And can I just lovingly tell you this? And I'm going to step on some toes. I'm good at that. Get over yourself. Give it a try. I've got excuses for days. But we just have to get over ourselves and go try. We want to help you find community. So maybe you don't need to come down and be like, I've never encountered Jesus, but maybe you need to say, hey, I need some help. I need to find my people. Again, we'll be down front. We'll be in the cove if you need help with that. When we encounter Jesus, man, it changes us in great ways. It frees us up for things that we have never considered. My hope for each of you is that your encounters with Jesus every day are ones that bring you life and joy and they push you and they challenge you. So Father, we come, we thank you for the truth of your word. We thank you for resurrected Lord Jesus. We thank you that you desire us to be in a relationship together with you and with others. So this morning, I pray for my friends who are in this room. If they need to start a conversation about who is this Jesus you're talking about, I've never seen him in this light. Give them the strength, give them the courage to start the conversation. And for those that maybe they're like, I've got my reasons, I just can't trust people, I've been burned, whatever it may be, Father, I pray that you would help them to get past that and to find their people their community that encourages them and pushes them and holds them accountable and shares their stories of who Jesus is. Not for the sake of glorifying ourselves, but for the sake of glorifying you. So thank you for your son. Thank you, Jesus, for being a a Savior who is approachable, for being a Savior who is above anything that we can even remotely communicate and imagine. We love you. We pray this in your name. Amen. We hope that you enjoyed this message from First Baptist Startwell. And if you did, make sure to subscribe so you can listen to our sermons as soon as they're available every week. If you'd like more information about how you can live sin at First Baptist Startwell, please visit fbcstartwell.com slash connect.